Hey guys, welcome to another Bikini in the Brain podcast. Today we are bikiniless. <laughs> Ashley is in Pittsburgh, so it is just a brain podcast. And I decided to do a live Q&A. So I'm on Instagram answering questions live. Um, and I asked some questions last night that we're going to go into. And um, just kind of jump jump right into them. So thank you everyone who's joining me on Instagram right now too. I'm going to be posting this up everywhere. So um, let's go ahead and jump right into some of the questions that came up from the people I ans- uh, asking on Instagram. Okay, so the first one I'm seeing here is um, from the evolving, the evolving, the Instagram name. <laughs> so um, her question is, she wants to hear about two conditions. So what is going to basically say, say someone's two condition when someone is, um, where, where's that point of conditioning where it's too much? where the judges should be stopping and saying, okay, this is a little bit too much. Well, um, generally where you're going to see it is you're going to see it a lot in the graininess of the muscle. You're going to see it in the legs of the muscle, probably more than anywhere. Um, It's going to be the most easily identifiable. And the way that you're going to identify it more times than not is going to be the quad separation when they're walking, the uh, the glute detail, the glute striations when they're doing their transitions to the back, when they're walking in the back, and then the hamstring separation that you'll see in the back pose. Generally, when you're seeing those things, the girl's too conditioned. Now, there are scenarios where the judges will um, still pick someone who's a little too conditioned. Maybe she was the best one there that day that fit all the other categories, but her legs were too conditioned. And, you know, I mean, she might not win the show, but she still might place higher than others because even though she was too conditioned, she was better than everyone else, everywhere else type of thing. Um, you can look at a show this weekend at the Night of Champions. Uh, the the second place girl, Jessica, she was definitely too conditioned in her legs. She had full quad separation, full hamstring separation, um, glutes strided. You know, I I think that with with her look and those striations, and I just did a video that we put on um, on YouTube reviewing just the recent shows that went on. I think that she was a little too conditioned in that one. Um, I think she placed a little higher than she probably should have. Maybe the judges didn't see it all the way. Maybe she was just really really tight at night, and the morning show wasn't as tight. From where I was sitting, she looked really, really tight at nighttime. And so, yeah, those things come in. Now, she's also a more petite competitor. So is that the scenario where a more petite competitor doesn't look as muscular when they're as tight and she was still better than everyone else there? That could be the thing. But I do think that if she was fuller in her legs, um, she would actually look better anyway. And that's probably what she's going to need to do to move up in the ring. So look for those things when it comes to the uh, conditioning detail. Don't just try to be as lean as you possibly can. That's a that's an issue a lot of people run into. They just keep trying to lean out and lean out, and they don't know where to stop. And it's hard. And that's the thing that I would say that's the hardest part about being a coach, is telling someone it's it's not getting someone in shape. It's I think the the hardest thing to do about being a coach is the knowing when to stop because then it becomes solely the coach's responsibility at that point. And it's really really you need to be really really confident when you make that decision for an athlete. And I've had to make it quite a few times in my career. I mean hundreds of times really, and um it gets to the point where when you think a bikini competitor is too muscular and you're like, okay, now we need to stop here because if she, if she goes to a show after that and the judges say, oh, you need to be more muscular and you had her kind of slow down on her growth and her workouts for six months. Now it's on you. Now it becomes entirely on the coach. Or if you say, okay, that's enough. We don't need to get you any more condition. And then the judges are like, you need to be tighter. You need to be more conditioned. Well, now that's on you too. So that's the hard thing to do. You know, getting someone as a coach, if you get someone as lean as you can and they're still not lean enough, that's really easy to do. Anyone can do that, you know? Um, it's it's just, okay, keep trying to lean them out, keep trying to lean them out, and then you lean them out all the way up into the show and they're still not lean enough. Well, you know, that's just one of their preps that went that way. You didn't have to really use any real skill. You have to fill them out at the end, of course, with skill-wise, but pulling them back and knowing where that perfect level of conditioning, that's where you get, that's where you see a lot of the separation of like the top coaches and then everyone everyone else is that that eye to detail of the little poses, the little conditioning, the fullness. Um, and that's why you see the same guys winning all the time. It's always the same people that are winning all the time. Um, it's like, it's like watching poker. It's like the same guys in poker are always winning the poker tournaments. Like, why is it? They figured it out. You know, they, they're, they're better than the other people. And so they, they have that perfect eye. And that's, um, that's something that just comes with a lot of time. It comes with a lot of mistakes. Um, I've made a lot of mistakes myself to learn these lessons. And so, you know, the more, the more mistakes, I guess a coach learns, the more, um, the more they learn from them throughout their career. And then the less likely you're going to be to make those mistakes because they've already kind of have it in their, in their bank of don't do that again type of thing. So, 
All right, now let's go ahead and look at um, the other questions we have coming in here. All right, so sorry if there's a little bit of a delay on my on my talking on these. I'm reading through these questions that are coming in. I want to get some good one. Okay, so, all right, this is kind of an interesting one, and I think that there's some... Um, it's a, it's kind of a controversial one, I will say, and I, I'm never one to shy away from the controversial topics. I don't think that that's, it's weird in our sport. It's like almost like coaches and athletes, like don't want to ever say anything about judges or what they disagree with the decision or anything like that. And I'm like, I don't know why it's like that in our sport, because in all sports, literally in every single sport in the world, coaches have disagreements with referees with umpires with judges i mean it's literally every sport in the world but ours it's like oh i shouldn't say anything i don't you know and it's funny is that the judges they want to hear feedback like they actually want to hear feedback um i've never had a judge like get mad at me because i said hey i disagree with that decision i think this is why i disagree with it judges have never been like oh how dare you no no no. it's never been like that they've always been like okay i see your point then no, no, no. yeah um thanks for it whatever i'll take it into consideration um, but this is why I, th I think it's right. You know, they'll tell me that. So there's nothing wrong with that. In all sports, we play professional sports when we're doing this. At the highest level, there's going to be, it's a subjective sport at that. So there's going to be people who disagree. It's okay to ask those questions. <clears throat> ask, if you disagree with something, ask the judges. Tell them why you think this went right. Be professional, of course, but ask them, you know. And so this, the question came in um, from IFBB Pro underscore VH. And her, she said, should judges be allowed to judge after situations like what happens in Europe with perfect score? I think someone needs to take control over this. It's not fair to the athletes. And so what she's referring to is the perfect scorecards that come in. And now I don't think anyone should be like banned for it. I think that that would be an extreme action. Um, but I do think that the judges need to think for themselves. And I think that that is a big problem in our industry. And I'm not afraid to say it because it's the thing that, that the athletes – need to have that level of fair judgment from each judge. And so what she's, let's, let's go ahead and break down what she's referring to. So what she's referring to is the constant perfect scores that we see on the judges' scorecards, right? We see perfect scores in many, many scenarios on judges' scorecards. Now I've had mathematically ran the numbers in the odds of five people scoring someone in a subjective class, especially like bikini, ranks one through five with perfect scores without any disagreement in between. And they've all just perfectly lined them up one through, there's one where it was like one through 10 with an absolute perfect score all the way down with zero disagreement between it and this objective class is, is one in millions, right? It was one in like 3 million when I ran it once. And that takes into account throwing in, throwing out the high and the low score, which is what the argument was before when I first ran the numbers, still in the 3 million range when there's five judges two the high and the low are thrown out and three scores are taken into account and they all agree from one positions one to 10 all the way down, it's between it's one in three million chance that that can happen, right? So if that was happening once every three million shows, I'd be like, cool, those are the numbers. Even if it was happening once in every million shows, I'd be like, cool, those are the numbers. That's That makes perfect logical sense. But it happened again last weekend. It happened three times that I've seen so far this year. There hasn't been 9 million shows this year. <laughs> so statistically, that's an impossibility, right? So what's happening is the the head judge is the one deciding these shows. So in that scenario, I don't know why the other judges are, are there. That's the, that's the reality of things. There's no other sport where the head judge makes all the decisions. If you look, if we went to like ice skating on an on a Olympic level, which we're playing at a world level here, right? The, the Olympia is a world level. All shows, all professional shows are world level shows. If we looked at ice skating and one judge decided everything and all the judges were like, okay, well, let's see what, let's see what uh, Tom thinks about this. And I'll just go with whatever Tom thinks. We would, there'd be so much controversy at every Olympics, right? There's, there's a lot of room for, um, there's a lot of room for just, uh, you know, shadiness happening. Not that there ever would be, but there's a lot of room for that. One guy can like, just like a girl more and, and put her in the middle and then everyone has to go with him, right? That shouldn't be happening in any, in any sport. Every judge you're there to judge have confidence in your skills and don't just pick with who the head judge puts in the middle. I think that is a mistake that they're, that they do make. And I think that that can be recalibrated. And I think the best way of recalibrating that is by not moving people in the middle. 
I think you do. I think the first call outs are super fair how they do it. And I, I don't want to say it come off the wrong way. I do think the judging is mostly really accurate and fair. 90% of the time it's, it's right on. But the, where it becomes a problem is, is that at shows where like in Europe, where you have a guy who's maybe not as experienced as a judge and he puts someone in the middle and the other judges who are less experienced than him just agree with him. And they're just like, yeah, we'll go, we'll go with whatever, you know, Tom said, I don't know if there's a judge named Tom out there. Sorry. I'm not, I'm actually using it as a, as a hypothetical name, but the, the, that's, and that's where it becomes a problem. And so in that scenario, I'm like, why are you even judging? Why are you even there? You're just a body <laughs> putting the score down and multiplying whoever's head judge score is. W what's the purpose of you being there? You know, have some confidence in your skills, you know, and, and judge for yourself. So I think that the way to answer that, uh, to answer that issue that that's going on is to simply do the first call out how they do it. Cause the way the first call out works is so you guys know, it's very fair. Uh, all the judges kind of put who they think is in the first call out. And that's why you'll see them do the initial round of comparisons. And then they get all the papers back in, right? And they get all those papers back in. And then they like start adding up the scores and the judges are talking back and forth. They're adding up the scores and they're like, oh, well, you know, Tina had whoever uh, as, as a first call out and, and George had whoever as a first call out in their opinion. So they start adding all these scores together and say, okay, there's three judges had this girl as a first call out. Let's put her in the first call out. Let's see how she does. And then they start comparing. But when it gets to the point where it's in the middle, right? They start moving girls to the middle. That's where the problem becomes on when the, when the shifting happens, because then the head judge is like, I think that this girl should be in the middle. I think this girl's in second place. There'll be some talking back and forth between the judges, of course, but there shouldn't be these unanimous decisions in the most subjective classes for 10 positions in 10 shows a year. That's, that's crazy. That's, that is the judge, one judge following another judge. And I don't think it's fair to the athlete. You know, I think that sometimes we under, we overestimate what these professional athletes are are getting in return and we have to be more fair to them because the professional athlete in bikini if they win the show they're going to win you know fifteen hundred twenty five hundred dollars something like that but it's going to cost them fifteen hundred twenty five hundred dollars to get to the show right so it's the the way that these athletes are making money isn't on stage they're making money off the stage this is a platform for them this sport is really a platform for them to to become popular become an industry uh, an industry sought after athlete, whether they do coaching or posing or sponsorship from supplements or, or posing seminars and things like that. But it's, they're not making the money on the stage and it, the, the investment that goes into getting to this stage. I think the athletes do need a little bit more, um, I guess I would say fairness and, and respect for that journey that they make. They kill themselves in the gym. And I do think that it would be better to just, you know, get your first call out together, get the first call out of the girls together and then, um, and, and then simply just don't move anyone around, you know, don't let the head judge have so much power, put them on stage, get the top six, whatever it is that the, the, you guys accumulatively thought who the best person was. And, um, you know, don't move anyone around, maybe just do a simple shift where you move the three girls to the left, to the right. And then the three you know, girls from the right to the left. And so you do one shift only, and it's the whole group. And then that way, all the judges can see them from the right angle. And the judges say, hey, you know what? I'm good enough at this job where I can pick who I think is first. And then you add it up and then you have a really fair score at the end of it. And you have no more of these perfect scores, one through, you know, in, in 20 shows a year where competitors one through 10, all the perfect score from supposedly five judges, right? It's, that's not, that's just not, it's not a statistical possibility for that to happen. Not in a subjective class like that. It's not like we're lifting weights and we're like, oh, they lifted the most weight. So she wins. It's not like that, you know? It's not like a race where we see someone finish at the finish line and there's no subjectivity involved. We're talking about, you know, the hardest division to score and we're getting, you know, 10 perfect scores with 10 different completely, uh, 10 different athletes in 10 different shows from five different judges. Like that's, it's just not possible, you know? So, so yeah, I do think there is something um, wrong with that. No, I do. I know more goes into it. There are highs and lows thrown out. I want to put that out there, but um, I, yes, I think there is a better way for that. And I hope that they will, you know, uh, make that a little bit more, I guess, give that opportunity to the athletes too, to, to, um, you know, give them that, that fairness because, you know, it could be the same thing happening at the end of the day. It could be the competitor who won wins every single time, but at least it looks more, more fair. Athletes don't feel as cheated. Cause that's the problem is that athletes feel like a little bit like wronged by it, you know? So anyway, that is, uh, that's my take on it. I feel it's a very fair take. I'm very, I'm very, uh, not afraid of, of saying what I think is right for the industry, as everyone knows, sometimes that's a positive for me. Sometimes that comes with backlash for me, but I'm always going to do, I'm always going to do what's best for the athlete. And 
that's really this my my mantra. Always do what what I say. Say um, stand for something or fall for any fall for anything, right? And so um, I'm going to be the stand for something guy, whether no matter what comes with that. All right, so um, let's go ahead and okay. I'm trying to look at these questions. Keep those questions coming, guys, on Instagram. I'm watching your questions come in while I'm doing it on Instagram, but I do have some questions that came in already that I can jump into. But I want to make sure they're good questions that we can go into and um, go from there. Okay, you know what? Um, I'm going to go into, a, this is a pretty basic question, but I, I do want to go into something that's been a little disturbing in the industry that I'm going to be doing more video. Uh, I'm going to be doing a video on it pretty soon, and I think it's going to be a little bit eye-opening, and I'm going to give you guys some insight into it. I'm not going to tell you who I'm going to be doing the video um, with or on, but it will be coming soon. Okay, so the question comes from Ziana.fit on Instagram. It says, besides keeping things tight in the off-season, do you recommend specific food during prep and off-season to keep the waistline tight? Okay, so so kind of a basic question. I, I've covered these things quite often before. Um, I'm a fan of single-ingredient foods. So I'm, I'm a fan of single-ingredient foods, um, keeping things very simple in the off season. And um, the reason I'm a fan of these like single ingredient foods is because of actually a few things. So one, when people are tracking macros, there's a lot of people want to do the macro thing. And I don't think there's anything wrong with doing the macro thing, especially in the off season, but there is a lot of room for error in the macro thing. You know, when we talk about people tracking with precision with, um, you know, uh, process, like I wouldn't even say processed food, but multi-ingredient foods, I guess I say packaged foods, fast foods, things like that. When they actually run this, the stats on how, how off people are when they're reporting those things, it's significantly higher off when they're doing a macro tracking diet. You know, even things like my fitness pal and whatnot is a user based, um, data system. So if you wanted to put in chicken, if you type in chicken, you're going to see a bunch of different chickens from users, from different people, because you can add to it, which is nothing wrong with that. If you're using the accurate ones, but you know, you, it could get skewed pretty easily. You know, some people can overestimate, underestimate, so when it says 180 calories, someone can input 200 and you use that one instead. So there's a lot of things like that. But also here's the, here's the biggest um, issue with that is, uh, so when you're a coach, you're going to be making these adjustments on a weekly basis based on the check-in. And that's, that's how we do it here at Team Elite Physique. We'll make an adjustment based on the week's check-in. So it's, it's always just based on the week of progress. However much progress you made that week, we're going to make an adjustment accordingly to how much progress you made. If you made you know too much, we're going to adjust it. We made too little, we're going to adjust it. We're going to have targets every week, whatever, right? So it's always based on the week. But those progressions and those adjustments are pretty small. They're like micro adjustments. They're, you know, maybe you're changing something 5% more calories, 5% less, 10% more, whatever. They're, they're not, they're small adjustments. So at, if you're off on your diet by 20% reporting, 25% reporting, whatever, how is a coach going to be accurate making a 10% adjustment? It's pretty hard. It's a, it's a pretty hard thing to do. So... Um, th so you want to be as accurate as possible in the off season when you're trying to keep, keep things tight, you know, that's going to be anything. Also, you know, working on your digestion all year and making sure that you're keeping your waistline tight all year will have positive effects with your waistline later on, you know, and that's one thing that we got to talk about too, that people don't want to hear about because it's an uncomfortable truth. So when we talk about someone having a really tight waist, like how do they have a, such a tight waist? you know, um, in, at the show, there's such a small waist. Well, the people who are getting like their waistlines, like progressively tighter are usually the same people who are staying leaner in the off season. And so why is that? And where's your proof of that? Right? Well, let's go ahead and go into like just some, some proof that we can kind of see one, look at, look at bodybuilders. And the thing that's like common with bodybuilders, like right now is, you know, they talk about the roid gut, you know, words like, Oh, they take too many steroids and their guts are big. Right? Well, um, if you look at a bodybuilder now, right, when they're like in season and they're they're getting ready for shows, they have a big gut on stage, right? What's causing that? Is it actually the steroids? Because if you look at them when they're retired, their waistline goes right back down to normal. If this was, if this was, so there's this thing called hyperplasia, which is basically cell growth. So multiplying of cells, I'm sorry, multiplying of cells. There's, so there's a hypertrophy, which we all know, which is increasing a cell size. So you get a cell and it gets bigger. 
that's hypertrophy. But if you're adding more cells, that's hyperplasia, right? Hi, hi, so it's basically multiplying of cells, things like growth hormone, IGF-1, things like that could potentially do that. Just lifting could potentially do that, right? So you can get more cells, right? So if the gut growth was steroid and growth hormone related, which tends to be the, the what people talk about as the cause of it, that would be hyperplasia, right? That would be multiplying of cells so your gut's actually bigger, right? Well, what, then if that was the case, it would be permanent. You can't now get rid of those cells unless you did it surgically. So you can't get rid of those cells. So why are the bodybuilders' waistlines going back down smaller after they're done competing, after they're retired? They go right back down. Okay, so maybe it's something different then, right? So what is it? Well, yeah, I agree. They're taking more steroids than they used to. Back in the day, there's more available. There's more things out there. There's, you know, the, the bodybuilding now is, is a... There's a, there's a lot going on there. That's why you don't see me training bodybuilders anymore because it just got too crazy for my comfort. But so what what is it that is happening? Well, because they're able to take in, take on, they're taking more stuff, more, more PEDs and whatnot and working out harder and using more science to grow faster. They're also able to feed that muscle more. So they're eating more than they ever ate before because they're also, yes, they're also taking more than they ever took before. They're also working harder than they ever worked before because the recovery is better than it ever was before and they need to feed those muscles. So now instead of someone growing as they used to, where they would max out on like, you know, 3000 calories back when there was only, when there was nothing available in the fifties, there was no, you know, they just started taking testosterone or something. They just started it. Well, now there's a whole bunch of things and now they're able to take on more calories, eat a lot more food. So yes, what happens? Their, their guts get bigger in relationship to the volume of food that they're eating. So if you're a bikini competitor and you are, you know, you're one of these bikini competitors that just like that, that is blowing up every off season and you're wanting to be the next world champion, but you're not keeping your waistline tight, don't expect your waistline to be super, super tight. And for you to progress that waistline smaller and smaller when you're having these off seasons, when your waistline's getting bigger and bigger, it's going to take time for that waistline to get smaller. Just like the bodybuilders who step on stage and everyone's like, oh, they got a roid gut. Remember, they've been prepping and eating less food for 16, 20 weeks at that point. Their guts are still big. But when they retire for you know a year, then you see them and their guts are smaller, right? So it's going to take some time of that lower volume of food for your waistline to get smaller. That's an unfortunate truth for a lot of people. So yes, keeping your waistline tight, um, keep that's one is body fat period, uh, purely two is the volume of food that you're eating in the off season. If you're trying to progress to get that smaller waistline over a cumulative amount of time. Now, is this absolute an absolute science? I want to give you the disclaimer. It's not, it's a visual thing that I see, but I think that it's pretty simple to see that. I don't think that there's going to be much argument in that. Um, and I think that you could see that with competitors who are progressively getting their waistline tighter and tighter. If you look at, I mean, look at Ashley's waistline over the last few years and how she's been keeping her waist tight. Look at it, it's gotten smaller, right? Look at the competitors who have the smallest waistlines. Are they blowing up in the off season? Look at Issa, who she never blows up in the off season. Look at Janet, she never blows up in the off season. Their waistline is tight. These are the girls that you know to have a tight waistline, right? So this is this is part of that unfortunate truth that you off seasoners that go too hard in the off season, you know who you are gaining 30, 40 pounds in the off season, you know, or 25, if you're a five foot girl and, and saying, Oh, I just need to have balance. And, but you also want to get to the Olympia. The unfortunate truth is there's people who are working harder than you that deserve the Olympia title more than you do because they're doing it year round and you're doing it 16 weeks at a time. And that's just the truth of it. Now, the other part of that, that I wanted to talk about was the, not just the single gradient food. So this is something that's been a little bit of a bother to me. Um, recently I've been very fortunate and have been in contact with a, um, with a girl who owns her own lab and she's a doctor and I'll be talking about her pretty soon. And she's been doing tests on food. And the other day I promoted a food. I'm not going to say which one I didn't promote it indirectly. I just said, Hey, these are great. You know? Um, and she tested them and then she, she sent me videos of, um, actually a whole bunch of people sent me videos of it, of someone else testing these foods and it being inaccurate. Um, label reporting, right? And then uh, she contacted me. We've had some discussions about it and has actually shown me quite a few different inaccurate label reportings on these foods that we eat that are thought to be health foods that are promoted as low calorie. And I'm finding that a lot of them are significantly um, different than, than what they say. And when I say significantly, I'm talking something will say it has four grams of fat and it has 16 grams of fat in a serving. Something will say it has four grams of carbs and it has 25 grams of carbs. It'll say it has 140 calories and it has um, close to 300 calories type of thing. Right. And, um, and the problem is you run into two problems with that. Um, one is going to be the accuracy thing we talked about earlier, where the coach is trying to make these adjustments 
on these micro adjustments weekly, but you're not even giving them the right information because, and you don't even know that you're giving them the wrong information because you think, Hey, this person is credible. This is a credible company. They sell me these, uh, whatever's and, and they say they're 140 calories, but they're not, you know, they're closer to 300 or closer to 250. Um, and it's just, you know, that's, an unfortunate, an unfortunate thing. That's an ethical issue with these companies who have no problem just underreporting their calories to sell more product, which I think is just like the scummiest thing you could do, especially in our industry. Right. But you know, it's hard, it's hard to, to, you know, when you're trading, trading ethics for money, some people have a hard time making that right decision. Um, you know, so it's, it's unfortunate, but I'm going to be doing some videos with some lab tests. I want to make sure I do it accurately and give everyone a fair side. But I am going to be do showing these tests um, that I've been getting. There's quite a few companies um, that are out there um, that I've, I've I've actually consumed that not knowing, you know. And it's it's crazy. It's, but it, it actually comes down to if you think something is too good to be true, it actually unfortunately seems like it usually is. It's it's shocking, like how many of them are out there. So I'm very much a fan of the single ingredient foods in the off season, um, not only for the accuracy readings, right? The accuracy reportings to the coach. But unfortunately, there seems to be a um, an ethical issue with the companies that provide these uh, multi-ingredient foods choosing to use the lowest possible option of calories. Some, I don't even know how they're getting the calories to be that low on their reportings because they're so far off. It doesn't make any sense how it would get that off. Like one, for example, was listed as four grams of fat, tested at 14 grams of fat. I'm like, how would you even... If there is a variance in your ingredients, how would you even come up with that much of a significant difference? We're talking three times plus off. How is that even a thing? Or carbs, I saw one was um, was five times the amount off. And I'm like, are you using net carbs because it didn't test like that? So, yeah. So there's a so another another reason why I'm not a fan of macro dieting isn't just the macro dieting alone, but it's actually finding the foods that are accurate in the first place, you know? So yeah, not a fan of macro dieting guys. I never will be. I never have been. And it's, and it's funny is that I did try it for a period of time with athletes. And the reason I'm not a fan of it isn't because I don't think it's great on paper. I think on paper, it's fantastic. The reason is, is that I've had so many athletes try it. And I always had my worst results with those athletes that were doing it that way. Now, there are some athletes that will say, oh, no, I do it. My coach does it, and she's a big-name coach. Well, that coach is most likely doing clean foods and just doing it in a macro way. That's a totally different thing So than a, if it fits your macro type of diet. If it's, you know, this coach, let's say they're doing macro diet, and they're, they're, they have to eat, let's say, 150 grams of protein a day, but they're just doing it in a macro way where they're eating chicken breast the whole time, and they're just doing it. Some days they're doing three meals. Some days they're doing five meals. Like that's not really macro dieting. It's just kind of getting bigger portions of clean foods and smaller portions of clean foods and spreading it out throughout the day. Like Ashley does that all the time. Kimber does it all the time. Sometimes she eats three times. Sometimes she eats six times. That's kind of, you know, the clean macro. If you want to call that macro dieting, it kind of is. So it's, uh, that's, that's a different thing, right? So um, yeah, it's an unfortunate thing. I'm going to be doing some videos on that. Um, not the most comfortable videos to be doing, but I think it's the right ethical thing to be doing for the industry to create some light on that. Just so I'm, I'm accumulating tests and making sure they're valid first. But the ones I've seen so far, pretty shocking, <laughs> disappointing at the minimum to say. Um, so yeah, that's unfortunate. So yeah, I'm a big fan of single ingredient foods. Um, also for like the athletes on my team too, is if you know, if you're eating something that is, you know, whatever made by a manufacturer or maybe a smaller manufacturer and it says, Hey, this, this, whatever, this peanut butter is lower calorie or this, uh, whatever has a digestive, you know, variability where you're not going to eat as many calories or this whatever is only 140 calories, but it tastes significantly better than the other 150 calorie whatever's are out there, right? Um, be, be, sus be suspicious of it because it's, you're most likely right. It's most likely wrong. So um, it's, it's, it's a crazy thing. It's an unfortunate thing in the industry. So anyway, there, that's a long answer to that question, but it's one that I think you need to talk about. So stay, so stay following for that. I'll be doing those pretty soon here. I'm getting more tests done. We just tested three more products. Um, the other day, we're doing like multiple samples of each product in different batches of foods just to make sure it's accurate. So yeah, crazy, craziness on that one. People are already emailing about it. Companies that, that uh, know I'm doing it are already emailing about it. They're scrambling. <laughs> they're, I'm like, why don't you? It's funny. Uh, they messaged me and they're like, you know, well, we're, this is why we don't do it this way. And I'm like, well, why are you choosing to use the lowest possible option when you know it's been food tested at a laboratory with the precision accuracy why are you choosing to use the lowest 
nutrient that like that you're coming, you can possibly come up with. And I'm like, is it, is it just to sell product or is it, is there a valid reason for it? And they gave me these like run around answers. It's pretty funny. So um, anyway, yeah, I guess I want to be a, a industry uh, watchman, <laughs> but um, it's, it's more of this doctor who's been doing this for a while and she's got, got a whole bunch of stuff. So it's going to be cool, cool interviews that we'll be doing on it. Um, okay. Let's see here. More questions. All right. So I'm going to go into one of the, I don't have, keep those questions coming guys. I'm reading through them. But I do have some questions that were asked yesterday on my Instagram, and I have some good um, insights. I got a lot of questions, but not too many of them were were usable. Um, okay, so okay, so here's a question. Actually, I will use. Have I ever had anyone on very low diet? Let's say protein only, maybe 700 calories for weeks at a time before a show. Um, that is a that is a hard one. I would say no. I don't think I don't think I ever have. Um, there's there. Here's the thing. There's situations, guys, and I do. You do have to ask. It doesn't. It's not as easy as black and white, and that's the problem with it. Right? It's not as easy as oh, do you have someone on 700 calories in two hours of cardio? unfortunately on paper that sounds terrible right but you have to see what led up to that right what led up to that person doing that um one how much does that person weigh are they four foot five and you know have been doing uh two hours of cardio their their whole life so when you give them two hours of cardio it really doesn't create that much of a stimulus because they're like training for marathons and they're four foot five so they don't burn that many calories in general and they've been eating a thousand calories, 1200 calories their whole life. Cause they're small. And so 700 calories, isn't that big of a deal to them? Is that the scenario or is the scenario? This girl is Kimber's height. She's five, 10, 140 pounds and never does cardio and eats clean all year. Well, then that would be a big mistake if someone did that to her, if she was staying lean, right? The other scenario is too, um, is this girl doing like a major show? For example, let's say someone came to me and they were like, Hey, um, I got accepted to the Arnold Classic. I just found out it's 13 weeks away and I'm 25 pounds over stage weight, but it's an opportunity of a lifetime. I have to do it. I should have thought about this before I applied. I didn't think I was going to get in and I just was really bad on my diet. Can we get in shape? I'll do whatever it takes, right? Well, what do you do there when it comes to ethics as a coach, right? You know you're going to have to crush this person. You know it goes against your ideology. It goes against my ideology. I don't. I. I. I never want to have a girl go under 1,100 calories. Really, um, I never want a girl to do more than an hour of cardio if I can get away with it. I mean, it's very rare that I have someone do that much. But what do you do, right? What's the What's the answer to that? If you're dieting down and you're trying to get her leaner, she has 25 pounds to lose, and and she has 13 weeks, and she gets stuck for three of those weeks. No matter what you do, she gets stuck for three of those weeks. You know, the body's weird. It's not always going to be linear two pounds a week. I wish it was. It'd be simple. But she gets stuck for three weeks. We're four weeks out now. She still has to lose 10 pounds. What do you do, right? What do you do as a coach? Now, here's the problem that becomes a problem is the, the athlete needs to take responsibility why they're at those 700 calories. Hey, I was 700 calories and two hours of cardio because I was a jerk in the off season and I ate everything I saw. I, I did not manage my off season right. And it's my fault. I said I would do anything and I had to do that show. You'll never hear that part of it, though. What will happen is you'll hear the girl will do the Arnold, right? She'll place terribly, and then she'll blame the coach, not saying anything about her part at all, and say, hey, this coach had me eat 700 calories, do a bunch of whatever, and you do two hours of cardio, right? That's the reality of, of the industry and what happens. No one takes responsibility for themselves. I'm not saying that coaches aren't to blame here sometimes, for sure. I'm not ever going to give a coach a pass when it's their fault. I There's mistakes I've made. But I've never made that mistake of putting someone on that low of calories, that high of cardio, unless they were the ones to blame for it to start and they put a situation like that on me. But even then, I still don't think I've gone that low or that aggressive. But I, there are scenarios where I could see it justified if the athlete met the right specifications, like I just said, like a short competitor, very light competitor. Of course, they're going to burn less calories. They're already doing a lot of cardio. They weren't eating a lot in the off season. They had a lot to lose going into the show. There was an urgent time frame. So that's the, that's the thing. You have to look at things as black and not just so black and white. You got to look at both sides because there's going to be a lot of people who are who say that, you know, and they get done with their show and they're like, bodybuilding ruined. You see these girls who do that. Bodybuilding ruined me and I, 
it messed me up. And I'm like, no, you just were never good at bodybuilding. And now you want to blame someone <laughs> and you are terrible in your off seasons. And what happened was now that you're, you can't get in shape anymore because you're not motivated as you used to be for this. Cause you have to eat so little because you gained so much in the off season. Now you want to blame someone. You're just going to say bodybuilding ruined you and gave you that gave you an eating disorder. You had an eating disorder when you started. If you're eating super, super clean for 16 weeks and you eat everything that you see in the off season, gain 30 pounds, that too is an eating disorder, right? It's not just that eating clean got gave you an eating disorder. I don't think eating clean and healthy and eating an adequate amount of calories and doing a good amount of cardio is unhealthy. But the way that our, the, the problem is, is that in our society today is people are a lot more likely to tell someone who's eating healthy that they have an eating disorder than to someone who's eating poorly, right? People have no issues telling someone who's in great shape with a six pack, like, you know, like Ashley, for example, will get comments on her stuff all the time. Uh, eat a eat a eat a cheeseburger. Right? That's always a common one. Eat a cheeseburger, right? Anyone who's a competitor will get those like random ghost account comments that are like just losers at their house who have nothing better to do besides try to like make their day a little better by by hurting someone else as much as they can. It's a that's a, and if you're one of those people, guys, you gotta you gotta work on your mental health. If you're like having these ghost accounts to like just bring people down because it makes you feel better, uh, you know that's a that I feel sorry for those people. I never like look at the comment like as in man, that really got me. I feel like, man, can you imagine being that person who has these multiple accounts um, just to say, just to talk smack because it makes you feel better about yourself? Man, I feel like what kind of life are you living where that is the highlight of your day? So anyway, but when we come back to the, the argument, right, in society, we can have, it is, it's no problem for someone to tell someone, hey, eat a cheeseburger when they're too lean. But it's a big problem if I were to tell someone who's 100 pounds overweight, hey, you think maybe a salad instead would be a better choice, right? Because one, I'm actually potentially helping that person and saving their life, adding years to their life and adding life to their years, right? By being upfront about it. But the other one, person's just eating healthy and living good, right? But we shame them, right? It's acceptable. That's how backwards our society is, right? And so when we say, oh, we're eating clean, I'm, she's eating clean for her show, that's an eating disorder now, right? Versus eating clean for a show is the bad part. Blowing up and eating everything you see and gaining 30 pounds in the off season, that's the, that's the balance part. That's the good part, right? How backwards are we, right? How backwards are we? The good part is eating healthy and staying lean and staying clean. There's no, there's no credible doctor who's not, you know, who's on the right side of things saying, not saying you should eat healthy, you should do cardio, you should exercise. There's no one doing that, but, but we shame the people who are in shape because, because they're insecure about themselves, right? That's the real reason for it. You're insecure about yourself. You don't want to, you don't want to, you know, shed light on someone and give them light when they're doing good things because it makes you uncomfortable because you're not willing to do those things to look that way. And so it's better to just say, oh, they're extreme. They're obsessed. They'll, they need to eat a cheeseburger, right? But over here, 40 pounds, 50 pounds overweight, can't go upstairs without breathing hard, can't do the sports that you do, have knee pain, right? You're at risk for a ton of different cancers, all these different things. I can't tell that person to eat a salad. I can't tell that person, maybe you should manage your weight a little better, right? So just be careful with that. Don't let the societal pressures influence you the, the wrong way um, because they can grab a hold of you and they can start spinning your own mind and then you can fall into that trap without even knowing. But common sense, if you think about it, common sense should always prevail. You know, the thing that our athletes are doing in the sport, most of them are doing very, are very, very healthy. So, you know, if you're eating, you know, 1,500 calories and you're a 130-pound bikini competitor and doing 30 minutes of cardio a day, that's not a shameful thing. That's a beautiful thing. It should be honored and respected and inspiring to others. Um, it should never be, like, looked down upon as an, you're obsessed and you got a problem, right? So, anyway, that's my little soapbox speech on that one. Milena's giving me the the, the, <laughs> the head shake as an approval. Yeah, I don't I – don't, uh, I think one thing that's that uh, that's been good for me is I never give in to societal pressures. You'll never see me like not just have my own opinion, and some people like me for that, and some people hate me for that because I say it's it's too real. <laughs> but I'm not going to give in to societal pressures. That's a good thing about being in my position. You know, I can retire if I want to. You know, I'm uncancelable <laughs> because if you cancel them, what am I going to do? Go sit on a beach, <laughs> like sell my properties and go sit on a beach for, for the rest of my life. I got no issues with saying what I want. So that's a good place to be, right? So uh, <laughs> you could kind of say, you know, it's it's a different thing when you're trying to please everyone. But the problem is when you try to please everyone, you lose yourself, you know? And so um, that's they'll, they'll shape you, you know? So just ignore them. Ignore those secret accounts. Ignore those people that are they're saying those things. I feel like I went off on that one in a little different way. 
All right, so <laughs> I'm getting a clap from Elena, though. People need to hear these things. These young people need to hear these things. Stand for what's right. You know, stand for what's right, even if it's uncomfortable. You know what's right. So, um, all right, here's a good one. Um, this is a hard one. I don't know how to answer this specifically. This says, um, Van Vanessa Howell, what percentage of athletes do you think fail to grow because you don't know, because they don't know how to train properly? Also, do you think bikini athletes should be training like bodybuilders, forced reps, widow makers, failure sets? And they just call sets anything these days, widow makers. It's like, it's, let's just call it, you know, let's just call it just, a, the, just the, the most ridiculous thing I can call it that like incorporates pain to make it as, as, uh, <laughs> as like le least desirable to do it, you know, <laughs> like it's so funny. That's all making fun of you, Vanessa. These people, that name came to you. Someone else made it. I'm going to call it a Widowmaker. It's more hardcore. Yeah, Widowmaker. <laughs> it's just, just, just lift weights, bro. It's fine. Lift weights hard. You don't need to call it some stupid shit to, to make it, to make you seem better and more extreme. It's so funny. So, um, I can imagine the guy who made that. I can see the guy who made that, who like made that in the gym, right? Look, oh, there's a Widowmaker. Yeah, it'll be hardcore. Yeah, bro, protein. So <laughs> it's just like, dude, so, bro, just, so you're doing a drop set? Like that, so you're just doing a drop set. <laughs> like, because those have been called that forever. <laughs> God. So um, anyway, as far as like what you need to, to do the, uh, to, to grow. So here's the thing, people, there's a, there's a, a logical way of doing exercise, right? And then there's the, there's a bikini way of doing exercise too. So it's, it's a tricky thing. How do we create muscle? We've talked about it. I did a video on it recently. I'll, uh, uh, maybe I could put it in, we'll put it in the description. Yeah. The, uh, the, the one about the nuclei and stuff and how we grew. I think the one we just did. So well, um, Elena's going to put it in the, in the description here, but the, um, the way that you grow is really quite simple. You know, you, you just have to work harder than you did the last time and create a stimulus and then leave time for ample recovery. That's all. You know, it's not this crazy thing that we need to, to really go into and, and so much, um, I think people really do overthink it because all you need to do is you need to look at your, the, the, how you lay out the workout is important. How you perform the exercise with good form is important, of course, but the most important thing, the most overlooked thing is, did you work with enough intensity to create a stimulus to create the growth, right? So the way that we need to look at the workouts is, is not in this crazy, you know, oh, I mean, to make sure I'm doing this like specific scientific progressive, this, that like method it's, did I work harder than last time? Am I working, are my workouts designed over my body's weaknesses and strengths? Am I taking into account my sport, the structural, my structure and my sport, my lagging body parts, what kept me from being the best last time? Am I allowing for ample recovery? And am I actually giving my all in the gym? Am I actually creating, an, am I actually doing enough to create a stimulus so I can grow the next time? Because the, the thing that we look at is we look at a lot of, we look, here's the problem with bodybuilding too, is we look at other workouts. We look at other like, uh, sports and we kind of, uh, relate those to ours, but they're not relatable to our sport. And that's kind of where it becomes the issue, you know? So, um, you know, most of you guys know, like I, I, you know, I put it in my, my vlogs and stuff like that, but I do, I'll do a lot of boxing. Right. And if I'm getting ready for something, right? Like I'm getting ready for a, a, like a hard period where I'm going to be whatever competing or whatever. Like I'm going to have to do a specific workout for that to progress and hit that time frame Right. I have to hit a certain weight class. I have to hit a certain strength and a certain explosiveness. I have to kind of progress into that. I have to make sure I'm recovered before that. Right. But in bikini, it's not a progressive sport like that. It's not basketball where we're progressing till a specific point. It's not powerlifting where we're progressing to a specific point of strength that we have to hit, right? It's always making improvements. It's always making improvements. And it, but in bikini, it's mostly always making improvements on the same areas. You know, it's focus on the glutes, focus on the shoulders, right? Can I continue to work these glutes and shoulders from every angle and do it for a, a long period of time and still get that recovery? Am I going through and getting the right deloads when I need to? Am I breaking my physique down into what's needed to work more in higher volume and lower volume? Are my arms too big and I need to stop training those? And so it's more of a, in body, in bikini building specifically, it's more about how the layout is around the person's physique than it is about the scientific progressive manner. Because the problem is, is that you're so much volume on the hamstrings, the glutes in bikini, the shoulders and the lats, you kind of run out of room um, 
to keep making progressions. You like you're doing the same exercises. So an advanced bikini athlete can be working out their legs, their, their hamstrings and glutes three times a week, but how many exercises are even available for a bikini athlete, right? And the glutes and the hamstrings. There's not like there's infinite exercises. And if they are, they're just different ways of doing the same exercise, right? A lying hamstring curl, seated hamstring curl. Yeah, there's a bunch of different ways of doing those, but there's a bunch of different machines for those. You can do those on cables, you can do those with dumbbells, you can do those with machines, but they're all still the same positions, right? There's not a whole huge variance because you're, tar you're targeting so much of the same area all the time that there's not the huge workout variance in between them. Because if there was like, let's say you only did two exercises per, for the glutes. You say those, you only pick two exercises per glutes per workout period of four weeks then yes, you'd be changing your workout all the time and doing these crazy progressions, but that's not how bikini is. You're working pretty much as many glute exercises as you can that your body can handle to hit all angles and get a complete full glute, and you're doing that as often as you can and still recover. So some people, it's every other day. Some people, it's once a week. Some people, it's twice a week, and then they need to do a deload, whatever. But that's that's the difference, and so the main thing becomes, is your layout right? Is your is your uh, intensity right in the gym where you're creating a stimulus? Um, and those are the important things, more so than like a really extreme progressive system because we're not progressing to a certain end goal, right? We're not progressing to that boxing match where you need to be as strong, you need to hit a certain weight class, you need to be as explosive and rested as possible. We're not progressing to the the strength, the powerlifting meet where I have to be as strong as possible but still rested and progress and make sure my joints are good and kind of progress to that point and then pull back so when my body's rested so I can go right into that and do that. It's not. It's, it's nonstop. It's progressive in terms of your body, but it's not progressive in terms of your, your lifting so much. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a different scenario. We have to look at it for what it is, and that is what it is. Bikini is very specific to... Um, you know, to a, a small grouping of exercises. Because if you look at it, we look at all these different exercises. We look at, um, so first you have to look at the funnels, right? And it's very funneled. So you look at, okay, you powerlifting, sports specific, bodybuilding, right? All these things. So we go into, we go all these things, powerlifting, explosiveness, Olympic lifting, strength training, this, that, no, 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 right? CrossFit. But we pick bodybuilding, right? We say, okay, bodybuilding. So you go down one funnel, down one funnel, bodybuilding, Okay, we have bodybuilding, bikini, men's physique, cl classic physique, women's physique, fitness, wellness, right? Okay, oh, we're going to pick bikini. Okay, another funnel. We go down a bikini funnel. Okay, now we go to the bikini funnel, and then we're like, okay, what do I need to work on specifically for me? So now there's the me funnel. I need more glutes, I need more shoulders. Okay, so that's going to be higher volume, more glutes, more shoulders. Okay, I'm going to do this. I've been doing it for, for four years. I can handle a lot of intensity, a lot of volume, a lot of, um, and I'll still recover because my body's ready for it. That's another funnel. Now we're doing all the exercises <laughs> that you could pretty much you know, from all the angles. So how do you change that work up with, with crazy, like crazy all the time where it's, it's going to be this progressive method? Well, you're already at such high volume. You're not going to really progress the volume more than that because you're already going at max of them. So you just have to make sure you're recovering, right? Yeah. You go through periods of a little bit less, a little bit more, you go through high reps, low reps, whatever, but it's not like you're the, the, the muscle isn't as confusing as we make it. Just work hard, work specific to what your body needs, create the right intensity with the right form. Yeah. There's definitely a science to it. You know, I've, I trained more, I think I've still trained more than I have coached in terms of sessions. I, I worked as a personal trainer for 13 years while I was coaching um, still, but I was mostly a personal trainer during those 13 years working at 24 Hour Fitness. It was the best education I got. Honestly, I, I shouldn't have worked there that long because the money was not good uh, for those years, but it was like the best education I got. I got my hands on so many people and learned so much from it and trained thousands and thousands of sessions. And so, yeah, the workout part of it is important, but most of the time when you get to the point of bodybuilding and fitness competitions, most people are working out right. If you're not, go work with the trainer, make sure you're hitting the right angles, you're doing the right thing. There's a lot of specialists out there too, and make sure you're doing it with the right intensity. Um, but just make sure that you're creating enough intensity so you can create a stimulus so you can grow, and that will be enough. Uh, maybe you're, maybe you're, you know, if you're not and you're weak in the gym and you know it and you're not pushing yourself, maybe you should get a trainer a couple times a week to help with that and work on that increasing your intensity. But it's not this, um, is as crazy as people make it. So, um, I've seen some really, really high level athletes who just worked on and filling the muscle, not even going that intense. They just fill the muscle. Um, okay. All right, let's look at here. I'm sorry, I'm looking at more questions. Sorry if I, I hate that. I know that people listening on the podcast are probably like, why is this so quiet? Is it, is it still going? <laughs> but there's a lot of like questions coming in. 
Okay, so, all right, um, I did talk about this already, but how do you re- reduce your waist size for training? So outside of the eating and staying lean and keeping that waistline tight in the off season, um, I do think that the the higher level, and then I'm very fortunate where I get to work with some extremely high level people. I don't mean the highest level people. Uh, I work with the highest level person that's ever existed, actually, <laughs> and it's, it's kind of cool. So um, very fortunate with these with them. And so one thing I found to be in common with a lot of these high level people is the exercise selection is part of it too. So the amount once they get to that baseline of muscle, how much muscle they need, the exercise selection will change a little bit to make sure that they're not engaging the core as much because they have that baseline muscle where they need to have it. Um, so there's a lot of advantages to reaching that capped muscle area when you're a bikini competitor, where you're at that maximum level, because you could start focusing on shrinking your waistline by picking exercises that don't involve the core um, and, and doing the right exercise selection to minimize that. Um, now, on top of that, you know, vacuum training, wearing a waist trainer. People want to argue with me that the waist trainer works, but it works. If you need to fig- if you need to see visual evidence that waist trainers work, type in, go to YouTube and type in um, world's smallest waist, and you'll see a girl who did extreme corset training. She did it for years and years of her life, and she's got a waistline that's, I think it's 13 inches. It's the same size of a CD. I remember that. And then people want to argue me that waist training works or doesn't. And I'm like, it, this girl didn't start that way. She wasn't born with a 13-inch waist the size of a CD. So how are you? So if it doesn't work, how did she do it? And then she just happens to live in a waist trainer. So those are just just a just a, a matter of just luck, right? That They don't work. We're going to ignore that data. <laughs> We're not going to say that we can use maybe some of that data for our sport. Yes, waist training does work. I don't think it's, you know, I, I don't love it. I don't love that it works. I do make money off waist trainers. I'm not going to be completely like hidden about that. I have a, a waist training company. I don't even promote it. It just sells these things sell. They sell it great. If they're not, then great. But the, the reality is, is they do work. You know, if you need data to, to figure that out, go to YouTube, type in, you know, extreme corset training, type in, um, you know, world's smallest waist. You'll see some crazy things. I'll never think that you should do it more than, you know, one to two inches. You don't want to lose that natural shape when you're doing the waist training. But do they work? Yes. Have I seen it work at a high-level athlete who came in two inches smaller the next year where they had uh, the same level of body fat? I've seen that too when people did that extreme. So it's just, it it, it does work. Um, our sport is not, and I think sometimes there's some confusion on our sport that it's uh, because it is fitness. I think people think it's health and fitness, but our sport is not health and fitness. Our sport is an extreme physique sport. And so we need to get that whole like health and fitness mindset out of it. Like, oh, I shouldn't do this because it's, it's not healthy to do an hour of cardio and to eat 1,200 calories. Like, wh- where, did, where did that even become part of the equation? Yeah, I want to do this and I, I really want to do this with as high as calories and as low as cardio as possible. But if you're trying to look the way that bikini looks these days with full tie-ins, right? It's not, this is not, you know, 2013 bikini. You want full tie-ins, you want, um, you know, you're, you're having conditioning all the way. You're on shoulder caps and, and, and there are strided shoulders. They're saying they're not, but there is. Um, you want that level of conditioning. It is going to be uncomfortable. You're not going to, you're most likely, unless you're genetically one of these people, you're most likely not going to get there. 2000 calories, 20 minutes of cardio, macro dieting your way into an Olympia championship. Highly unlikely, highly unlikely. There's going to be some uncomfort, uh, uncomfortable things. You might going to need to, you, you might need to waist train. You there's, it's a very extreme sport. It is not health and fitness. And it's unfortunate reality but if you want to take it to that level, it's up to you. But any sport at the highest level is absolutely extreme. Our sport, I would argue, is the least extreme. There's, it's the most extreme in terms of the diet and the constantness of it. But in terms of other sports, like even when I was playing hockey at a high level, it was way harder than, than when I was doing men's physique training. Men's physique, I'd train for you know two hours a day. I'd do my, my cardio. I'd do my workouts and I'd eat clean. But hockey was two hours was just, that was just ice drills, not counting off ice drills, not counting... Um, explosive training, not counting studying. Like there's like, I mean, you're talking hours and hours of every day of, of that for, for that sport. You think Michael Phelps got to, you know, 10 gold medals by just being health and fitness swimming. No, he did extreme swimming. It's different. So we have to, we also have to look at that too. Um, unfortunate reality of, of life really. I mean, that's just an unfortunate reality of life. You want to get somewhere far in life. You're going to have to do extreme things. So, um, Okay. Where are we at time wise? All right. We're at 55, 55 minutes. I think I'll do, I'll do one more. I should probably answer one of these questions that people, uh, that people, people ask here. Um, okay. So there was one about skin. Okay. All right. So this question comes from Amy Zikwang on Instagram. And her question is, 
the concept of thick skin versus thin skin, racial or genetic differences, myth or not? And I think that's a great question because that comes up all the time, all the time. And so um, what is this whole skin thing, right? And it's funny because I talk about skin, my buddy James talks about skin, and we say things like thin skin, thick skin, and people are like, oh, it's an excuse for them not being conditioned or them being conditioned. And I'm like, like the coach didn't get them conditioned. They're saying we're using it as an excuse that they have thick skin or something like that. Like, we know how to get people to lean. <laughs> like, I mean, I don't, I don't know how many thousands of times I got to do it in my life to prove to you I can get people to lean. Like, that's not a thing. I, I'm fine with it, you know. I, I like to think I'm pretty good at it at this point. Um, it's, but there are differences in skin, the texture of skin. There's a big difference of it. Um, and in a good example, what we talk about is just like, you know, the thinness of skin. You know, and yeah, that's more of like a slang term for like the texture and how, um, how the muscle, how it's, how, it's, how it's on the muscle itself. Some people, it seems like they just have naturally thinner skin or maybe they just naturally hold less body fat. But you could see the muscle density a lot easier through the skin, right? And some people have that thicker skin it's a little harder to get them to have that same look to show that density and um and, it, and they're already they are lean they're just as lean i don't know the reasoning for this but we call this kind of skin texture we just kind of refer it to as like thin skin and thick skin some people have really beautiful skin texture if you look at like like phil heath how he was on stage he just like glue he was like he just glowed on stage it was his skin texture was beautiful you know and how it laid on the muscle it was just like this nice perfect balance of of just the shine and the complexion of the skin the 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 texture of the skin, you could still see the striations through, but it was still pretty muscle, but still grainy muscle for a bodybuilder. And now when we talk about, you know, skin texture with bikini, we want that pretty muscle. We don't want that crazy dense muscle. So, um, and you want that, that skin to have that little bit of like voluminous softness to the skin the texture that's on the muscle. So you have that nice, pretty muscle. Some people just have that thinner skin where you just see the muscle grain through it and it looks really dense. And it kind of, I refer to it as like, if you're walking as, if you see a horse walking and you see all those striations in the horse, um, they have that, like we would call that, that too much density showing, right? All those striations in that horse's hip when they're walking. We don't want to see that in a bikini competitor. Skin texture does apply to that. Um, and so, yeah, there are, there are, I, I do think um, there are differences in that. It's just a visual thing. It might be just slang for that, but there is differences. There's some girls who get really lean who still don't have that same level of detail. And there's some girls who just always have that level of detail, um, you know, and it sometimes it's a problem actually. And, and with, especially with bikini and those divisions that have to be leaner and not so grainy. Sometimes it's actually a problem. So there's a, there's a plus and minus to both sides of it, but I do think it's a thing. Um, a lot, pretty much all the top coaches out there say it's a thing. It's funny that the, the science guys and nutrition science guys say, Oh, they're wrong. All skin's the same or whatever, you know, but it's funny. It's always the, the guys who are winning all have the same opinions and the guys who never win or produce have, have the, have a different one. Um, so with that, uh, with that being said, uh, now, let's go into the uh, racial or genetic differences, myth or not, in the sport. Um, you know, I think that there's a lot less of that than people think there is, whether that's going to be, you know, causation, right, is is the race, or is it just a lot more people from um, from whatever whatever sports end up going into that, into bodybuilding, right, that type of thing. So, you know, I don't think that there's a iron-clad um, point of race being a different thing in the sport. If you look at all the bodybuilding champions, I mean, there's, when you look at all the bodybuilding champions over the years, you know, if you break them by, if you break them up by, like, if you give each one an Olympia championship, there's a, they're pretty much all over the place. You have a Jay Cutler was a white guy. You have Dexter Jackson, Ronnie Coleman, Lee Haney was a black guy. You have Arnold Schwarzenegger was a white guy, right? You have um, Rami, I don't know if you call him, would you, would you, I don't know what, brown guy, you call him? I know, it's like me. <laughs> yeah, it's like me. So it's like, they're just all over the place, right? I don't think that there's one specific thing. You'll see like reigns where I think people start thinking that. You'll see, you know, Lee Haney and Ronnie Coleman holding it down for, I don't know, 17 years or something like that as, as black guys. And everyone's like, oh yeah, well, it's a, it's a, it's, it's because of the genetics or something. I'm like, no, it's just, you know, it's just, just happened to be there with the best body for that many years. You know, it's not a, I don't think it's a race thing at all. So no, I don't think that goes into it. I just think that some guys have shined longer than, than uh, have held reigns longer than others. Um, and they just happened to be a certain ethnicity. And so people think that's the case, right? The same thing would happen in any sport. If you, if, if it's, if, if it was that way, people just see it as optics. So that's, that's what it is. Because if you looked at, if you looked at it as just that, yeah, the guys who had the longest reigns and held it the most, but if it was, if it was Jay Cutler um, had 
20, 20 Olympias, you'd be saying the same, oh, it's a, it's a white guy sport or something, right? It would, but that's just what happened. You know, just Ronnie Coleman, Lee Haney had so, so many Olympia wins and it just kind of people started saying things like that. So don't let that get in your head. I don't think it matters um, all that much. I've seen awesome people from every race, awesome, different skin textures from every race, different muscle bellies from, from different race. Uh, I've seen, you know, I've seen white guys that just grow like crazy. I've seen uh, black guys who don't grow and I'm, and you know, and everyone's like, Oh, you should grow or something because that, that is out there. That, that whole myth is out there. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's just, it's, you're either genetically, you hit the lotto or you didn't, <laughs> there's no, there's no, uh, there's really no rhyme or reason for it. It's just some people hit that genetic lotto and, you know, and I hate them for it because <laughs> I wasn't, I wasn't that guy. <laughs> so yeah, though there, and so I don't think that anything goes into that. I think that's a myth. And I, I really think that myth should die, honestly, um, because you just see too many variances of it in all divisions and all, uh, all the way around. But um, when you look at reigns and people who've held it the longest, if you look at just who's won instead of the reigns of how long, whatever ethnicity is won, you'd see a lot different story, I think. So um, anyway, I guess with that, we will end it there. Um, thank you guys for tuning in and all those questions. That was kind of fun. Different, different type of podcast. If you want more podcasts like this every once in a while, I'm happy to do them. We could do, do them every once in a while. I think Ashley should do one like this too. Just uh, that'd be fun for her to do one. <laughs> Maybe when I'm out of town or something. So anyway, thank you guys so much for tuning in. I appreciate it. And I'll talk to you later.